Amen. We want to welcome our online audience. It is always a blessing having you join us on Sunday mornings. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. And we especially want to uh, greet those from our own family who, for whatever reason, were not able to be in God's house this morning. Thank you for joining us by web stream. Well, after a long hiatus, it just seems like for so many different reasons, things come up. There's holidays or guest speakers, and we've been away from this series for a few weeks, but we're back this morning into that series on an upside-down kingdom. How many of you are glad that you're part of an upside-down kingdom because it's an upside-right kingdom, not as the world would see it, but if God says this is the way to live, then that's the path that we all want to follow. And we have been in the Beatitudes. We've come to the fifth Beatitude this morning, and our text is in Matthew 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you authored these words as they came out of the mouth of the Son of God. Now we ask that you would write them on our hearts, that they would not only be words that are in our minds, but words that are in our feet, words that are in our mouth, words that are in all of our activity, that we might reflect the Father in heaven who has called us unto himself and to be like him in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Mercy. It's a beautiful word, isn't it? But I believe it's really important that we define it because it often morphs into other words like compassion and kindness. But words like compassion and kindness do not accurately reflect the meaning of the word mercy. You know, often we speak of outreach ministries, we speak of going on missions trips like feeding the poor, and we call those missions of mercy. But actually, more accurately, they are really missions of kindness and missions of compassion. Another example is the parable of the Good Samaritan, which we know uh, Jesus used, and some people say, in this parable, we learn how to show mercy. And that's not to say that the Good Samaritan did not show mercy, but it really misrepresents the word mercy in its true and its fullest meaning. And so we want to this morning try to uncover the meaning of mercy, first of all, as we compare it with another familiar word in our Christian vocabulary, which is grace. Aren't you thankful for grace this morning? Amen. But sometimes people confuse grace and mercy. What is grace? Grace is getting what we do not deserve. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. God has lavished each and every one of us with so many blessings, but as we look at those blessings, how many of us can truly say, I deserve that? I think if we'd be honest with ourselves, we would recognize that these are just lavish gifts that God pours out upon us, and they're all of grace. We don't deserve them. We don't merit them. We've not done anything to deserve them, but God says, you're my child. I love you, so I want to give these good gifts to you. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. Are you familiar with that acrostic for grace, G-R-A-C-E, great riches at Christ's expense? That's why he lavishes us. Jesus paid the price, so now that the Father can just lavish us because the price has already been paid. Grace of God. Oh, we magnify the grace of God. We worship God for his magnificent and his, and his awesome grace. And by the way, don't ever think that God blesses you and me because we're good people. He blesses us because he's a good God. Amen? 
It's his grace that he shows us. He freely gives it to us. We do not deserve it. And isn't that what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How though he were rich, he became poor. Why? So that we through his poverty may become rich. And you and I are rich this morning because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's grace. But now what is mercy? Mercy, on the other hand, is not getting what we do deserve. Not getting what we do deserve. I think we'd all agree that as sinners, we deserve judgment. We deserve punishment. We actually deserve hell. But we don't get what we do deserve. We get his love. We get his forgiveness. And he gives us eternal life. Aren't you thankful for the mercy of God today? The mercy of God where he doesn't give us what we do deserve. Why is it that we don't get what we do deserve? It's because God is a God of mercy. You know, in the Bible, mercy is mentioned 174 times. I love this verse in Micah 7 and verse 18. Where is there another God like you who pardons the sins of his people? You cannot stay angry for you love to be merciful. I think if we'd be honest, we'd say we grit our teeth sometime when we show mercy because we don't want to show mercy. We don't feel like showing mercy. But God, our Father, loves to show mercy. We read in Ephesians, God who is rich in mercy. We read in the Psalms, we're to give thanks because his mercy endures forever. We read again in the Psalms, he's slow to anger and abounding in mercy. We read in Titus, he saved us. How? According to our works? No, according to his mercy. He said, they deserve hell, but I'm going to give them what they don't deserve. They deserve hell, I'm giving them heaven. I'm giving them salvation. I'm giving them forgiveness. I'm giving them eternal life. I'm giving them peace. I'm giving them joy. I'm giving them my righteousness. It's all of his mercy. Oh, what a God we serve. He tells us we are his favorite ones, and he loves us with an everlasting love. In spite of how much we've sinned against him, in spite of how our rebellion and how our selfish insistence on having our way and doing our own thing has offended a holy and a righteous God, and yet he has still wiped the slate clean, and he still calls us righteous. He still calls us his beloved And he sees us as pure and holy in his sight. It's mercy beyond anything that we could even imagine. He buries our sins in the deepest sea, never to remember them again. And that shows how different we are than God, doesn't it? People sin against us, we never forget. Jesus says, I never remember. And you and I need to see the sign at the ocean of his forgiveness, no fishing in the sea of God's forgetfulness. He treats us like our sin never existed. That's mercy, Christian friends. That's mercy. I hope we don't go through life just taking for granted the mercy and the grace of God. And let's confess and uh, be honest with ourselves how easily we forget the depth of his mercy that he no longer holds our offenses against us. And yet we're so quick to hold the offenses of others against us. This beatitude reminds us that if we want to be blessed people, who wants to be blessed? (laughs) We know what blessed means in the scripture. It means happy, not hilarious happiness, but a deep-seated joy, peace and rest that only comes from what God can bring into our lives. 
So when, when we read in the Beatitudes, blessed are, it's speaking about people who are happy, who are joyful, who others see as enviable because even though we might not have what they have, they see us as richer because we're in peace, we're blessed, we're joyful, we're happy in all circumstances. We have a spiritual blessedness and an aura about our lives that they just don't have. And we're prospering in the things of God. They might be prospering materially, but we're prospering in what really counts, in the riches and the glory of God's grace. The principle was of this blessedness that is accorded to those who are merciful is so important in the mind of Jesus that we read about it in other places in the scripture where he reiterates this mandate that we must be merciful as he is merciful. And this morning I want us to look at Matthew 18 where he really hammers home the truth in a very powerful way as he tells us the parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, this is a, a parable that I think that we're all familiar with, but perhaps we're not familiar with the, the context of it because it's in the context of Peter asking Jesus a question. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, Peter thought he was really being extra special because in the rabbinical teachings you were required to forgive three times but now peter is saying lord is it is it okay if we forgive up to seven times is that gracious enough well jesus answers him in verse 22 i do not say to you up to seven times but up to 70 times seven wow that's quite a contrast from seven, isn't it? Peter thought he was being generous with seven, and Jesus goes to the extreme and says, how about 490 times? Now, obviously, Jesus' answer is not a numerical value. It is rather a principle that if we are truly, truly children of the kingdom, that we will always, always, always forgive there should never be a second thought in our minds well i'm not sure i can forgive this offense isn't it interesting how we put limits on what god says in his word but as kingdom people the mercy and the grace that we've received that has been unlimited no matter how many times we have offended a holy God, and even after our salvation, we continue because we're still in this flesh. And if we're not really walking close to God, if we're not living in the Spirit, if we're not spending time in the Word and in prayer, oh, that old devil is prowling about like a roaring lion, seeing where your weak moment is, and he's going to pounce, and we fall right in headlong, sometimes not even realizing it. And then we say, whatever made me say that? Offending a holy God once again. And yet when others sin against us, we're not so willing to dole out the same mercy and grace. And so Jesus lays out this requirement by telling this parable there's a king, and in this parable, obviously, that king is God. He wanted to settle accounts with those who were indebted to him, and so he calls in the first guy, and guess what? This guy owes a huge debt. It's a debt of 10,000 talents. Now, that is an astronomical amount of money. In today's economy, it's worth millions of dollars. You could not repay that much money in many lifetimes. But when we think about it, isn't that the kind of debt that we owe God? Our debt is so great. And if we lived wholly every moment of every day for the rest of our lives, it still could not pay the debt for the sin that we've already committed in our lives. Oh, how wonderful is the grace of God. Alton uh, Howard captured 
this truth so well in this gospel chorus. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it, it's such a catchy little chorus and I love to sing it, even though we, we haven't sung it in this church, I don't believe. He paid the debt that he did not own. I own the debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Where would you and I be if it were not that he was willing to pay that debt by his grace and show us mercy by not giving us what we do deserve? We'd be doomed. But we thank God for his grace. And since this man was unable to pay, the parable tells us that the king then ordered that he, his wife, his children, and all of his belongings be sold to repay that debt. Now, what are you left with when everything you have and own is no longer yours, but now you're a slave to someone else? And so this man was overtaken with grief when he heard this judgment placed against him and he cried out for mercy. The servant, the scripture tells us, fell down before the king saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. What an amazing claim for such an impossible task. And when he pled for this mercy, something amazing took place. The king didn't say, okay, let's see how we could work this out. How about if you pay me this much? And if you could pay me this much over all of these years, and in this time frame, then, then we'll just cancel it. We'll take care of it. He didn't rewrite the contract. He didn't renegotiate the deal. What did he do? He completely canceled the debt and he let him go scot-free. Can you imagine? Millions and millions of dollars. He didn't ask for one penny of that debt that was owed to him. He just wipes it out. He cancels it. He obliterates it. And he says, you're free. You are forgiven. I, I'd like to even try to imagine that servant who heard such mercy and grace come to him through the mouth of that king. What emotions were exploding in his heart. Shock. Did I hear this right? A am I really, really, truly forgiven? Relief. This burden, this weight is lifted off of me. I don't have to carry it for another second, another moment. It's gone. Joy, my family and I are free. Thankfulness. I can start life fresh and all over again. And then awe. Is it real? This is too good to be true. But when we think about our lives, Christian friends, that's how we should feel about the mercy and the grace of God. To just be shocked, to be relieved, to be joyful, to be thankful, and to be in awe of such an awesome God that would show us such mercy and such grace. Now, why is Jesus telling the story in this way? It's because of how God has treated us. Our debt was so great, yet God in mercy 100% wiped it out. Every sin, every transgression, every iniquity. And so the king says to the servant, the debt has been canceled. Well, what does the servant do? He goes out and he finds the person who owed him 100 denarii. Now, compared to 10,000 talents, 100 denarii was like just a few pennies. He grabs this man by the throat and he says, you pay me what you owe me. And this man 
cried out for the same mercy, used the very same words. We read in verse 29, the fellow servant fell down at his feet, begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. But he would hear nothing of it. He threw him into prison and warned him he would stay there until he paid the last penny. But when the other servants heard about how cruelly he treated his, the man who was in debt to him, they went to the king and told him. And so the king called that servant back and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Now there's no opportunity for him to give any rebuttal, for him to fall on his knees and plead and beg for mercy. The king saw how unmerciful he was. And so now what he has sown, he is also going to reap. And his master was angry, the Bible says, and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Christian friends, this tells me there is a tremendous price that we must pay when we are unwilling to show mercy and to be forgiving. Mercy, mercy withheld means misery will be our lot in life. You won't be cast into prison. You won't be tortured by men, but you're going to be tortured by the bitter spirit that you are holding on to. Didn't Nelson Mandela say it so well? Not forgiving someone is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Think about that. And how foolish we are when we hold on to offenses that need to be forgiven. Offenses that need to be blotted out of our minds. See, what happens when we show forgiveness and mercy? It does release the other person from me. I'm in bondage to what that person did to me. And now I'm turning them over to God. I, they don't owe me any more debt. They don't have to pay back. I'm not expecting anything for the evil that they did to me. I no longer hold it in my power to judge because that is not my place. That is God's. And God will take care of it better than any of us ever could take care of it. And what does the scripture say? The parable ends with this very sobering verse. After he tells this story that is so poignant and so powerful, he says, and this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you, disciples, Christians, people who call yourself by my name, people who say I follow in the master's footsteps, people who say I obey the commandments of God, unless you forgive your brother from your heart. And that's not giving lip service. That's truly examining the bitterness, the hostility, the anger, the hurt, the pain, and saying, I release that person from what they have done to me. I've forgiven them. That sets you free. That sets you free and it absolves you from this judgment that God says I will treat you the way the master the king treated that wicked servant who was unwilling to forgive I'll tell you it should make us all think twice before we decide to hold on to an offense you know the best way to deal with an offense is to release it as soon as it happens look to the cross Look to the cross, see the mercy and the grace of God shown to us in all of our sin. How can one tiny little offense compare to all of my sin? I need to release it and let it go. Now we all know that after we get saved, we still blow it, 
And that's why Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us. Why is that included in the Lord's Prayer? Because Jesus knew we'd need forgiveness. Jesus knew we would continue to sin. And the purpose for doing that is so that we don't allow any opportunity for there to be a rift between my soul and my Savior. That we don't give any opportunity. Now, we could, I think, illustrate that well with marriage. How many of us know that in marriage, it doesn't take too long before the honeymoon is over and I do something to offend my wife or my wife does something to offend me? And then the silent treatment starts. We turn the cold shoulder toward one another. The sweet fellowship is gone. How is it repaired? When forgiveness is granted. When we say, I drop the offense. You don't spend all day long, I can't believe what he did to me. I can't believe what she did to me. They say they love me and that's how they talk to me. They say they love me. He says he loves me and that's how he treats me. Unless we let that offense go, we will never come back into that oneness of fellowship and union and joy and peace and harmony and happiness that God ordains for marriages. So brothers, a word to the wise. When you offend your wife, ask for forgiveness. And wives, if you want to hear what the Spirit is saying, you need to do the same. I like what Mike Bickle says because it really challenges my heart. He says, as a husband, if I believe I am 99 and 9% right and she's only one-tenth of percent wrong, I need to own my one-tenth of a percent and apologize as if it's all my fault. Now, how many of you women would like to have a husband like that? I know Kathy would. I'm not there yet, but, but I, know what, I know what the goal is. I know what the standard is. Sin is not dealt with in our lives as believers. That's a problem because we sense in the same way we lose our peace with God and the awareness of his presence. We have to deal with that rift by asking for forgiveness. And we do as we, Jesus taught us how did he teach us to ask for forgiveness? Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my debts. Forgive me for my transgressions and trespasses. We skip this next part. As I forgive those who sin against me. And if we're not willing to forgive them, then God says, I'm not willing to forgive you. This is preaching from the red letters of the scripture. We say we love God's word. We love Jesus. If we love a person enough, we'll listen to what they're saying. Jesus is clear on this issue of forgiveness, this issue of showing mercy. And the reason is because we have been shown so much mercy. The Bible speaks about that so often. Listen to Ephesians 4 and 32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. How's this forgiveness to be doled out? As God in Christ has forgiven you. How's he forgiven us? lavishly, freely, completely, abundantly, with no reservation, no second thought. His blood cleanses us and washes us. Colossians 3 and 13, be tolerant with one another. Forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another. How? Just as the Lord has forgiven you. Now, this brings home the message of the beatitude that we're looking at. Be merciful as God has been merciful with us. Because when we are merciful like that, we will continue to receive mercy in our lives. Very briefly, I want to illustrate this with the life of David. Did you know that in the life story of David... There was a chapter that took the expanse of 
more than a decade. In fact, many Bible scholars think it was between 10 and, or rather 13 and 15 years that he was hunted by Saul. Can you imagine someone having a grudge against you and actually hunting you down to kill you? Not to tell you off, but to, to take a gun and shoot you. That's how much Saul hated David. And David had to run from him. He lived in caves. He lived in caverns. He lived out in the wilderness for all those years because of Saul's jealousy, that green-eyed monster that possessed him, demonically inspired. Now, kill your enemy, David. That's how you get rid of this guy who's shown you up. Kill him. Destroy him. The Bible tells us that there were two occasions when David had the perfect opportunity. And all of the men that he amassed to travel with him in those days, they said, David, God is our God. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it because he has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now, David could have thought, you know, this Saul, he's been a real jerk. I've done nothing to deserve the treatment that he's given me. He has been chasing me like I was a dog or a flea. He's the king after all, and who am I? I'm a vagabond living in the wilderness. I'm no threat to this man. Why has he treated me this way? I've been loyal. I've been faithful. I've been good. I've been loving. I've been kind. I've won battles for him. I've made him look good. David said, God forbid that I sin against touching the Lord's anointed. And instead, he showed mercy. And after he takes Saul's spear, he goes to the other side of the ridge and he calls out and he says, my Lord, the king, listen to what respect. He could have said, Saul, you're such a jerk. My Lord, the king. Now, this is my paraphrase. While you slept, God gave you into my hands. And even though you deserve to have this spear thrust through your heart, I spared you. You know what that's called? That's mercy. Because Saul deserved to die at the hands of David. He was his enemy. And an enemy who in the Old Testament sought you an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Dole out the same kind of judgment. But Saul did not get what he deserved. And when you study David's life and see how he was so guilty in some areas of his life, this man who was after God's own heart, he committed some crimes and some sins that we would never even think of. But yet, instead of judgment coming into David's life, on more occasions than not, there was favor, there was mercy, and there was grace. And do you know why? I believe it's because David himself was a merciful man. And there again is the divine principle. Whatever we sow, we will reap. If you sow mercy, you will receive mercy. Before we leave this this morning, there are some caveats that I want to mention because you might be under that impression. Well, that means no matter what, I need to show mercy. But it doesn't mean that you need to receive back into your life a person who has manipulated you, who has abused you, who has emotionally drained you. And then they... They try to come back into your life, you know? They try to put the guilt trip on you. Come on, you're a Christian. Aren't you supposed to be merciful? Aren't you supposed to be forgiving? Yeah, merciful and forgiving, but that doesn't mean I need to open the door for you to come back into my life and to ravage my life and uh, to cause me to dishonor God the way we used to dishonor God because you want to live one way and I want to live another way. That's not what God is saying in his word when he says that we're to be merciful because he expects us to use wisdom. So be careful never to allow manipulation 
emotional manipulation to come into your life. But on the other hand, there's this other extreme that also requires a correct understanding. Sometimes we refuse to show mercy because we believe that if we do forgive, then we've just opened the door wide so that that person comes in and will cause the same offenses. They're going to hurt us. They're going to abuse us all over again. But as I said earlier in my message, forgiveness is releasing a debt someone owes without inviting that same offense to continue in your life. You don't want that to happen. King David, once again, is an example here, isn't he? After he said those words to King Saul, what was Saul's response? Oh, David, oh, David, my son David, you're a far better man than I ever could be. And even feigned an apology. But what does the scripture say? That when that scene was all over, Saul went back to the palace, where did David go? Did he go back to the palace? Did he go back to where everyone else was? Did he go back to sitting at the king's table? He knew Saul was still a madman. And if he did go back, he would have been nailed to the wall. So he went back into the wilderness. Saul could not be trusted. So we extend forgiveness and mercy to everyone who's ever offended us because that's a mandate in God's word. But we don't open ourselves to trusting them again until they prove themselves trustworthy. Release the debt. Tell the offender, you owe me nothing. I'm showing you mercy because I was a great sinner, but God showed me great mercy. Closing with one scripture this morning. This issue of being merciful is such a big thing to God. It's a big deal to him. And through the prophet Micah, he speaks. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? I want to ask you this morning, do you love mercy? God loves mercy. Are you a reflection of your heavenly father as his child? Are you a reflection of his character? God has been so merciful to each and every one of us. He doesn't give us what we deserve. So he asks us now to show mercy and not to give others what they do deserve. They deserve our hostility. They deserve our unforgiveness. They deserve for us to treat them the way they treated us. But that's not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is mercy, to love mercy. May God help us this morning. I was thinking of what song we could close with. And then my, the spirit of the Lord this morning, I've been wrestling with this all week as I've been preparing this message. The Spirit of the Lord directed me to an old hymn of the church at Calvary. How do we, how can we show mercy when we're so deeply hurt, we're so deeply offended? Mercy, there was great and grace was free. There, mercy was multiplied to me at Calvary. When we look to the cross, when we look to Jesus, who said to those who nailed him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know what they deserved? They deserved Jesus to call a host of angels to come down and consume them in fire, destroy them, obliterate them from the face of the earth. But instead, he cried out for mercy for them. Father, forgive them. May we be challenged this morning as we stand to sing this song together and look to the cross and the mercy that God has shown us that we as well will be merciful in our own lives. Let's stand together as we close.